how can we deal with worldly pleasures, lusts, anger, and hurts, and you fill in the blanks of whatever's happening with you if you do not submit this under the authority of Jesus Christ? So please turn to James. The Epistle of James, and I'll quickly give you a little bit of a, just a background for those who were not here or did not hear the sermon. We're following James chapter 4. And last time we looked in James, we saw how James uh, was saying that those who fight and have quarrels and that come from within their own souls, those who would actually have murder within their hearts, who are envious, who do not come to God, and when they do come to God, they come to God for the wrong motives. Those people, James says, talking to believers, they were the ones that God says, you adulteresses, you prostituted yourself. You have made yourself friendship with the world, and then you've made yourself my enemy. And we know that James has been addressing believers all along in this epistle. And it's no different here in our next passage, which will be from verse 6 to 10, as we read in a minute. But I want to remind you that James is addressing believers on how, from the very beginning of this epistle, how they deal with trials. Believers are known how they deal with life problems. Believers are known on how they are doers of the word, not just hearers, according to James. They're obedient people. Believers are known to show not partiality, but mercy, and be merciful to those who, who are in need, the poor. Believers are known by their faith, their good works. Believers are known the way they manage their tongue. And believers are known by the way they act wisely. Yes, James is always primarily encouraging the believer to walk holy and to be holy. And it is the believer who will receive grace upon grace. But what does God say? Who will receive this grace? Is it just applicable for Christians or also non-Christians? Is it just applicable for those who were born again or those who claim to be born again? Because James has been doing this all along. And James is saying that if you are not handling your trials and you're always falling into temptations, you may not be a Christian. James is saying if you're continually coming to church, and you're hearing the word of God. And I, I am thankful to God that most of you say you belong to a faithful God, gospel, expositing, preaching church. But if you're coming here and you're hearing good doctrine week in and week out and you are not moved, you're not a Christian. And if you come here and your tongue is continually aflame from hell when you walk out of here, on a Sunday, and from Monday to Saturday, you are envious, and you are demonic in your ways, and you're cursing, and you're bitter, and you're jealous. Shouldn't we examine if we are Christians? So let's read together from verse 6. As we ended last week, so I'm thankful to Brother John for singing, only by grace we can enter. Because it's only by grace that we can enter. It's very, very simple. So from verse 6, we read this. After James has exposed the person's heart and his flesh, how he's into the world, by what? Causing fights, having quarrels, being unforgiving, being bitter. He says, but he, God, verse 6, gives greater grace. Therefore, God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your heart, you double-minded. Be miserable, mourn, weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and joy, into gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he 
will exalt you. Let us be reminded that in verse, the verse before, in verse 4, he says, you adulteresses, plural. No one is exempt. No one is exempt from the sins in this world. No one is exempt from the pleasures of this world. And no one can say, I have arrived. You know what? Every time I pray to God, I don't say, fix my husband. I always say, fix me. Right? Ladies, that's what you pray. And the husband says, I never say, fix my wife. God, let your will be done. Right? No, we don't always pray that way because we are still sinners. And this is applicable to everyone who wants to be friends with God. He comes to God and he submits to God because God says to submit. He will resist the devil. He will draw near to God. He will want to cleanse his hands, be purified at heart because he desires not to have friendship with the world, but his desire is to have friendship with God. So the people that God speaks about that will receive this grace, God is now going to lay it out for us who they are and what he requires of them that they may receive grace upon grace, that they may be filled with God. If you're not a believer, it's a different issue. I'm talking to those of you who are born of God. So I've titled this, A Call to Fellowship with God. What does God say? What does the Word of God tell us how we ought to approach this God? In actual fact, if we're in sin, here is a perfect play, a place where we can know how do I deal with my worldliness? How do I deal with the devil? I mean, it's here, right? Now, unfortunately, and maybe fortunately for some of you, I don't have any three points for you. I don't. There's no three points for you today. There's one big sermon. But here there are 10 aorist imperatives. And what that means is they are commands given by God that require an answer. And they are they are. They are Eris per, imperative, it means that God expects you to pay attention to and to listen to with urgency. Okay? So I'm going to compile these together. I'll break them down for you slowly. And we're going to see six obligations. Six obligations that a Christian has before a holy God. And we will start with verse six. And seven, let's understand this. God gives greater grace to whom? The humble. He opposes the proud. The proud does not come to God. Let's understand that. It's only the humble. He says, submit therefore. Now, therefore, now everything that I've just told you, Therefore, pay attention to what I'm about to tell you. I will give greater grace, grace upon grace, to the humble person, not the proud. And we need to understand that. If a person is continuously proud, he may not be a Christian because he does not see himself as in need. Now, this word, submit, it is passive and it is plural. And what that means is, God is expecting you personally, not just you, but everyone who hears the word of God, who was born of God, to actively submit to God. But whenever the prideful man hears the word of God, he does not land on our uh, receptive heart, but it lands on a heart that he does not think he needs to submit. But, but when it lands on a humble heart, uh, this person, the humble man, knows that submitting to God, it is for the glory of God and for his own good. A humble Christian submits himself under God because he knows it's good for him. The psalmist in Psalm 73, when there are wicked people, crazy people around him that are doing all sorts of stuff, he says, but as for me, the nearness 
of God is for my good. Psalm 73, 28. It's for my good to be near to God. This is a humble person. But a prideful person in desiring to fulfill his lustful wants, his anger towards his wife, and all his unforgiveness, warring, seeking to make more war, will never submit to God. They'll say they have no problems. But the one who is humble at heart, the one who is humble at heart, he will come to seek God and to seek his face and knowing that God is seeking him. Why? Because God speaks to us and says, submit. You know, we often say, James wrote. I want to remind you, James wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, which means God wrote, right? God said, submit, brothers and sisters. Come, seek the Lord. We ought to be like the psalmist who says, you have said, seek my face. And my heart said, Lord, your face I will seek. This is a humble man. That's Psalm 27, by the way, in verse 8. I want to ask you, my beloved friends, what are you seeking this morning? I mean, are you seeking Christ? Are you seeking his face? Do you want to submit to him? Do you want to be near to God? Then come. Come with all of your sins. All of your pride. James has just told us how bad we really are. We are called prostitutes. What a loving God. He says, come with all of your sins, all your pride and all your anger and all of your hurts and humble yourself. Be aware of this. Come under his mighty hand for his hand to his beloved children. is gentle. But I can tell you this. That the same God, if you keep on resisting him, that same hand can be the hand that will crush you under your sins, that will crush you in your arrogance and your pride and your hurts and your wants. David, when he was unrepented, he said, For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with a fever heat of summer in Psalm 32 verse 4. What a gracious God. He says, come, come humbly, come and submit yourself. And what does that mean? It means to surrender your self-willing and affections for this world, your thoughts, your mind, all your will under Christ. Why? Because he is a jealous God who loves his bride. This is the people that God will give grace upon grace. Not the proud. Bring everything under his rule and say, Lord, take rule. I don't want to be stubborn, Lord. I don't want to rule my own life. I've gone astray in my own ways. I want to submit everything unto you, God. You are my master. You are my commander. You are my chief. Because this word here, surrender, is used in a military term where a soldier will submit himself under a captain, under someone who was higher than him. Beloved, did Jesus not himself even submit unto the Father in the garden? Jesus submitted unto the Lord when he was tested by the devil himself. Are we not called to submit to the Lord? Jesus understood his own role in his flesh to submit to God the Father. Should we not submit to Christ? We either submit to the Lord and say, God, take all of me and be slaves of Christ or you will be slaves of sin, slaves of the world. We ought to be like the Apostle Paul 
who by the Spirit of God penned down these words, I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life now that which I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. That's Galatians 2.20. Oh, beloved, how much do we need to come to God? And listen, God, He expects us to come to Him in a certain way. This is part of it. In submission. In submission. How can we deal with worldly pleasures, lusts, anger, and hurts, and you fill in the blanks of whatever's happening with you? if you do not submit this under the authority of Jesus Christ, who, who is the very person who pinned, nailed, died, and rose again from the grave for those sins. That's your first obligation. As a believer, your first obligation is to come under the authority of Christ. And submit to him. Come with your sins. Come with your wants. Don't try and fix your stuff before you submit to God. It's not going to work. You need to grab all your junk, all your rubbish, and all your hurts, and all your wants. And you come to the foot of the cross where you're going to find life. Submit it all unto the Lord. That's the first obligation. The second one, read with me, is in verse 7. Still in verse 7, submit therefore to God and resist the devil. This is another imperative. We are called to resist the devil. Now, I found this very interesting because James has just finished telling us that the source of quarrels are in you. You cause the fights, you are envious, you lust, you desire, you murder, you ask wrong, you are the adulteress. You have made yourself an enemy of God. Resist the devil? What's going on? Why, why would James say that? All that is true. You are accountable to God for your sins and your love for the world. But the old serpent, he likes to manipulate and distort all that God has put in place. And he hates all relationships, because this has to do with relationships. What causes quarrels and conflict among you? Satan hates everyone who has a relationship, especially with God. And he will bring before you murder and hate. He's the father of lies, right? And he was a murderer from the beginning. It's so not like him who is restless and wants to destroy all the children of God just to offer them worldliness and we explained that last time worldliness is not so much so for we to go out party get drunk and do drugs according to james it's not it is a fighting that happens among people it's relational more than just me loving the world it happens in a relational sense but we are called to resist the devil that means we are called to resist temptation of getting angry and hurting and fill in the blanks. We are called, this word to resist means to fight against. Hey, brothers, we are fighting a spiritual battle. What do you think that means? When we're saying we are fighting a spiritual battle, when the temptations come to you, fight it. That's what this is saying. It's saying oppose it. Stand firm. That means make yourself friends with God. Stand firm. God, who is a jealous God, he says, come and submit to me and I will give you grace upon grace. But the spirit of the power of the prince of the air who works now in the sons of disobedience says, you come to me and I'll give you your pleasures now. God is lying to you. He wants to break your relationship, not only with God, but with all the people around you. These are your temptations. He's the accuser of the brethren. It offers you lies, a quick way out of your marriage, perhaps if you're having marital problems, a quick way of your relationship with God, with your neighbors, fake promises, temporal security, you name it, you fill in the blanks. He does not want you to have fellowship with God. 
And he's been a liar since the Garden of Eden. Just to put doubt into people's minds, the believers, about God and God's promises. Now I want to propose something to you. Satan and his minions, it's not just him, he's not omnipresent, but Satan and his minions, would you agree they've been around a whole lot longer than 16 years of life? I mean 16 years as a believer, by the way. I'm not sex, actually 16. Okay, stop it. If he and his minions have been around for a whole lot longer, then would you say, they don't know your internal because only God knows that, but would you say they know where to tempt you? Would you say they know exactly what you would fall into, what you're angry at, how, you're going to how they're going to distort you in your relationship with your family, with your kids and whatever, whatnot? Of course they are. The Bible tells us that Satan will bring traps and snares in front of us. He's crafty. He's deceitful. So he knows exactly every one of us, not him alone, but his little minions. In actual fact, he hates us that much that he will say to God, put forth your hand and touch all he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. That's what he wanted Job to do. He's cursed God. He wants you to do exactly the same thing. But let me tell you, once again, we are called to resist him and all the temptation. But James, I'll remind you, in chapter 1, verse 14, he says, But each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lusts. You are accountable for falling into his trap, just the way Adam and Eve were accountable to God them to fall now, he may put before you things like this God doesn't love you he doesn't love you that much how can you be a friend of God when your husband doesn't do husband things how can God love you so you get angry and your relationship is broken in your family and your relationship is broken with God You have an ungodly wife who's not saved, perhaps, or a son who does not believe, or maybe a sister in Christ who's hard to deal with and brings hurt and anger and all sorts of stuff. Oh, I tell you, Satan is a roaring lion. He never rests. He wants to destroy all that the believers have in Christ. And you fill in the blanks. I'll leave that application into you, into your own hands. But what must we do? Well, let me quickly turn to Peter. Let me read this to you. First Peter, how do I resist him? From verse chapter 5, verse 6. Here it is, the same picture. Verse 6. Therefore, humble yourselves where under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time we will see that in a minute casting all your anxieties on him would that mean your hurts your wants your failures your falls yes all of that cast it upon him why because he cares for you and then it says be sober minded and be on the alert for your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour we are called to stand firm be sober minded and resist him i just have one more that i have to touch on this ephesians chapter chapter 4 verse 27 it says, and do not give the devil an opportunity. In other words, don't give him a little bit of crumb. Cut him off. Go to the extreme. Think of Jesus. If your eye causes you to sin, 
pluck it out. Your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Do not give anything to the devil to take it because he will take it and he will mess you up. If you're, if you're in, J, in, in, in Ephesians, then turn to Ephesians 6. How are we supposed to fight this devil? How are we supposed to fight the temptations of this world? How are we to fi- supposed to fight all these things? From verse 13, Therefore, take the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything, stand firm. Stand firm. Therefore, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breast plate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all taking up the shield of faith with all with you will forgive me with which you will be able to extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. You see that. But if you do not resist then you cannot submit. You cannot come to God and say, I've submitted to you these things, but I'm not going to resist the devil. And you cannot resist the devil without submitting it to God because you'll fail. You will fail. I guarantee you, you will fail. And what does God promise in James? Resist the devil. What's the promise? He will flee from you. If you resist the promise, James says, if you resist the devil, if you've submitted, your obligation is submitted unto the God who loves you. Then he says, resist him. And here's my promise. He's going to flee. He's going to flee. What a, what a wonderful promise from God. The devil is a roaring light against the bride of Christ. Let me remind you that the God who loved you and married you to himself is called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And here's what Satan looks like under Jesus' roaring. He is a pussycat trying to scratch you because Jesus is the true Lion. And when we submit unto God and resist the devil, my King Jesus will crush him to pieces. And that's his promise. He may be the accuser of the brethren. Jesus Christ is our advocate before the Father. He sends his little minions to annoy you. Ah, oh, but our precious God, he sends his holy angels to comfort you, to protect you, and to guide you. What a wonderful God. So hand over your wars and your fighting, your anger your disappointments, your lustful thoughts, your sinful flesh, your unforgiveness. You submit it all to the Lord and resist that devil who wants to destroy you and he will flee just like when he tempted the Lord Jesus. He fled when you submitted to the Lord. The third obligation, that's a second one. Here's our third one. Verse 8, back in James. We're still in verse 8. I'm not sure how far we're going to get from verse 8. Draw near to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Forgive me, that was verse 7. We've moved to verse 8. Then it says, draw near. Draw near to God. Once again, this is an imperative. This is a command. We're not just commanded, here it is, Lord. We're not just commanded, well, I'm fighting the devil now. We are now commanded to come to God. We are coming to Him. And this means draw to Him with everything that you have, with your thoughts, your mind, and your passion, coming to Him as a whole person. Let me tell you something. This goes back 
God resists the proud but gives this greater grace to the humble. A humble person is not happy at just being saved. He's not happy to be a Sunday Christian. He's not happy just to be adopted. I'm a Christian. That's okay. Leave me alone. You're judgmental. Stop looking at me. Sorry. A humble Christian, he desires to have much more grace. A humble Christian, he wants to draw near to God to behold his wonderful face. A humble Christian is not happy to be in the sheepfold. And Jesus is here, but as long as I'm in the sheepfold, I can see Jesus from afar and say, I am a Christian. And he's sitting here and he dabbles with everything else into the world. But I am still still in the sheepfold. No, no. A humble Christian who will receive grace upon grace. He desires to be so close to Jesus as if Mary, as Mary was, holding and the beauty of Jesus Christ in the manger. A humble Christian is not happy just to be a Christian. That's what it means to draw this close. And what's his promise? Look at the text. He will draw near to you. What a wonderful God. You have gone astray. Oh, you are like a, like, like, like a, a, a prostitute. You've gone into the world. You're doing these things. Here's what I'm telling you. I will give you grace. Humble yourself. Bring everything to me. Submit it under my authority. Resist the evil one. Come to me. Draw close to me. And I'm going to show you my face. You're going to see the face of Christ. Are we not often like the prodigal son who says, Thank you, Jesus. I love what you give me. Thank you. And then we go into the world and we desire to have passions and affections somewhere else. But if you keep reading about the prodigal, there's a wonderful picture. When he comes to his senses, when he knows he has sinned against heaven and his father, and he says, oh, I desire to go back and only to eat the, the, the stuff that the pigs are eating. I'm not even worthy to come before this, this God, before my father. What happens? It was the father who saw him. The father had compassion on him. The father ran to him. The father embraced him. The father kissed him. The father gave him a robe. He gave him a ring and he gave him a feast. This is the God that we worship. He's the one who says, come. And he is awaiting to run to every child who belongs to him, that he would embrace him and they will have sweet fellowship together. What a God we worship. So come near to God. We are called to come near to God. Fourthly, so I'll move. Verse 8 still. Um, draw near to God. And he will draw near to you. And then we are told, once again, these are imperatives. Cleanse your hands and purify your hearts. And this is speaking of an Old Testament enemy. Of course, when the priests will go in the tabernacle and they will have to be externally cleaned before they could approach a holy God. So why does James put that here? Because James is saying externally you need to be cleansed. You need to repent. You cannot approach a holy, wonderful God who is your Father, who died for your sins, and you carry all your burdens without saying, I want to get rid of them. Psalm 24 tells us, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? It says, And who must stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and pure hearts and psalm 24 verse 3 to 4 this is a sign to approaching god rightly you're coming to god expressing pure desire desire for him for cleansing you don't want to have friendship with the world 
You want to have friendship with God. And what this is saying is this, brothers and sisters, sin, believe it or not, still makes you unclean to approach God. Yes, it is Jesus who washes away our sins. But if we approach him in an unworthy manner, what are we expecting? Are we not told to approach Jesus rightly, even when we come to the Lord's Supper? That some who did not approach God properly in an unworthy manner were sick and some even died. We need to do the same. This is acknowledging our external and our internal problems. And then it says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. doesn't get any more straightforward than that. You sinners. James is saying, you're a sinner because you are selfish in your desires, in your lusts, in your wants, in your anger, in your unforgiveness, in your murderous hearts. You are a sinner and you need to come to repentance. And when he says here, you sinners, James is calling for a radical change to take place. A radical change to take place that you may have fellowship with God. Purify your hearts. God says, I'm holy, so be holy. So you're talking about here, what James is saying is you're purifying your external and your internal. Let me explain to you what James is saying here and then we can move to the next bit. You cannot come to God and say, God, forgive me for my sins, only so that your desire is to do them again. You cannot come to God and say, well, <clears throat> I've stopped doing them. <clears throat> forgive me. But inside of you, you're warring and you still desire to do it. No, God says, bring all of it. Come so that I can cleanse you in and out. It means you are repenting from your external behavior and your internal attitudes. Then he says, look at this verse. Keep reading with me. Be miserable. Verse 9. Uh, forgive me. Verse 8. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Don't come to God with a double mind. In actual fact, this scripture, it talks about the word in and of itself says two hearts, two souls, two people. You're called to come to God with one mindset. You're called to come and worship God and God alone. You're not supposed to be married to Christ and flirt with the world. You're not supposed to say, I surrender and submit and I resist the devil. But you know what? Just let me just 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 let me hang around here a little bit. This is a double-minded person. But I want to give you something to think about. This word, double-minded. James has already spoken about it in verse uh, eight of chapter one, and I think I spoke about this last time. James speaks of this word to people who are unstable and unbelievers. Is it not just like James that he will put in a word in there to stir up the hearts of those who are claiming to be Christians? It says, if you're a double-minded, then you have to examine, are you committed to Christ or not? What does a double-minded look like? Well, let me give you some examples. He's talking to a church, right? It could look something like this. Some, they come to church and they say, I'm coming for God. But they are very far from God himself. Some, they come to church and they sing songs. But they don't really yearn for the glory of God. And they don't want to behold his glory. They just sing songs. Some must say that they love God. But in their lives, their affections are for the world. This is a double-minded hypocrite. 
that James is talking about. Some, most, and I pray all in Saving Grace Bible Church carry their Bibles under their arms. But I pray that the heart is not left somewhere else. Some take notes through the sermon, but there's nothing written on their own hearts. Some perhaps act godly, but in their lives, they're denying the power of godliness. Some clothe themselves with some sort of humility, but inside, they have envy and bitter jealousy. This is a double minded, unstable, hypocritical person. You do the math what James is saying here. I want to leave that with you as an application in your own mind. Because what I understand, this word is applicable to unbelievers. And James puts it in there, challenging the believers. If a non-believer does this, then what does that say about you if you fall down this path? It's very, it's very stern here. This passage is very, very stern and very challenging. Well, here's our fifth ab- obligation, and we're going to see three imperatives here, and four really, but I'll, I'll compile them together as James now intensifies the demand for, from God. When we look at verse 9, and he says, look at this, be miserable. This is, this is hard, is it not? Just be miserable already. Mourn, weep, let your laughter turn into mourning and your joy to gloom. This is hard stuff, right? Now, I don't think James is saying that if you are miserable in your life, that you're going to prove that you're close to God. No. But a humble person, not a proud one, comes to God when he sees his sinfulness and he becomes miserable in his sin, not towards God. James is saying, be ashamed of your sins. If the Lord has not been your friend and you've befriended the world, then be afflicted. Misery, if you're a Christian, should be your company if you're living a sinful life. Let me tell you what I mean by this. David, when he had sinned greatly against the Lord and says to you and you alone, I I have sinned with Bathsheba, in Psalm 32, he gives us a little picture of what he was like when he was hanging on to his sins. Psalm 32, verse 3 to 4 says, When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away. Though my groaning through my groaning all day long, for day and night your hand was heavy up on me. You see, David was miserable. That's what that means. And James then continues, says, Be miserable, mourn, and weep. Uh, let your laughter turn into mourning and your joy into gloom. What is all this? Well, We grieve because we've sinned against God. We weep because this sin has separated us from the sweet fellowship with God. This is the one who comes to God with a broken and contrite heart. You see the same picture, by the way, in the Beatitude with Jesus. And I do believe that James has borrowed borrowed those words from his half-brother. And of course, in that, in a Sermon on the Mount, it speaks of unbelievers to come to save in faith. Then if they used for us, how should we approach the God whom we love? This is a person who comes with sorrow, weeping, that he had failed God. This is Peter, when he saw himself, when he denied the Lord three times, he walked away bitterly, weeping. If everything has been true and we see ourselves humbly that way and you're a Christian, this ought to make you this way. And James then continues, let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. 
I don't think James is asking the Christians, just be depressed already. Just cry already. Stop laughing. What's wrong with these freaky Christians? Don't be joyful. That is not what he's saying. What James is saying is stop being joyfully in your sins. And let that joy turn into mourning. That's not the joy you're supposed to have. You're supposed to have the joy in the Lord, in Christ Jesus. Flee those pleasures and let your affections for the world become to you bitter tears and gloom. That's what James is saying. Let your joy and your love for toys become a shame to you. Let your obsession with the world depress you. Let your fleshly desires and anger that curse cause havoc in your own lives and to the people around you bring you so low. But why? Why does James say all these things? Why should I be like this? Well, we'll look at it in a minute. Verse 10, which will be our, I'll give you applications through it, I think. But it will be the top of all of this because it's always grace. How can we receive the grace of the Lord if we are not submitting our lives under his authority? How? According to James, we can't. We are proud. How can we fight the good fight and be in fellowship with God? How can we, we know our temptations if we don't fight with the devil? If we are not drawing near, then whom? Are we drawing near to? If we're not drawing near to Christ because we want to behold his wonderful face, because we have a friend in Jesus, not in the world, then where are we going? If we say that we are cleansed and we don't need a purification, have we arrived at a point of perfection? Because if you are, if you think that way, you belong to the wrong church. This is a hospital. We come here to, to feel some healing. And virtually I will hear amen, right? If we continue to be friends with the world, then where is our friendship with Christ? So let's look at the last obligation. The last obligation, verse 10. Humble yourself in the presence of the Lord. It goes back to the very beginning. Humble yourselves. Where? In the presence of the Lord. Why? He will build you up, pick you up, lift you up. He will exalt you. You see, we could sit in the synagogues in a wailing wall and confess to a priest and have lots and lots of tears and lots and lots of mourning, lots of glooming. It does not mean we know Christ, nor will we deceive, uh, receive grace upon grace. Cleansing, purification, all by themselves, just righteous, self-righteous acts. Misery, mourning, weeping, all for themselves, are external, nothingless. Unless we come to God humble. Humble. Let me tell you something. There are two ways to be humble. God says, humble yourselves. Right? He's calling us to come to Him humble. If you don't come to God humbly, you don't want God to humble you. You come to God humbly with all your sins, all your flaws, all your failures, He will give you grace upon grace. But if you're proud and you don't come to God, His presence, without humbling yourself, He will humble you. 
And he may just do that all the way to hell. What's the result? He will exalt you. Jesus said, whoever exalts himself shall be humbled. And whoever humbles himself will be exalted. I want to encourage you this morning that if we love God, our focus, our aim ought to be unsatisfactory towards Christ. Meaning this, I'm satisfied in Christ alone, but I'm never satisfied enough. We ought to say, I want to submit to you, God. Oh, take all of me. Take all my sins, all my failures, God. I want to resist this devil who does nothing but bring havoc in my life and my relationship with you. Oh, help me, Lord. I want to be cleansed. You said be holy because I'm holy. God, I want to be holy. I want to be pure because you will exalt me. That's coming to God with humility. How far will you go to be closer with Christ? This is a call to have fellowship with God and not to have friendship with the world. But I cannot and I will not go past my unbelieving friends. I'm going to read you a passage, a parable from Luke 18 that Jesus spoke about. There are two people, two men, Jesus said. He went to the temple, that's Luke 18, verse 10. They went to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Let me show you what the proud man thinks. Don't think, oh, but I don't do that. We're talking about a hard attitude. He's showing it externally, and we have it in Scripture, but this is a hard attitude of a, a proud man. The Pharisee stood and was praying to himself, God, I thank you. I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, and even like this tax collector, this filthy man. I'm nothing like him. But I'm, I'm thanking you for that, God. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes. All that I get. But the tax collector, some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven. This is a humble person who comes to God humbly. He says, the Bible says, he was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I am the chief of sinners. I have sinned greater than Stalin and Hitler if they were there. He's saying, I am. If there were nobody on earth, or I don't care how many people are on earth, I am the greatest sinner that ever lived. Because he saw himself next to a perfect and holy God. And here's what Jesus says. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. This is salvation. There are no ten steps of repentance. There are not, grab your Bible, go to church, do this, do that. All those things are after justification. That's what we call sanctification. Justification is you coming to God saying, I am the sinner. Have mercy. What a wonderful God. And Jesus says, this one here goes home justified and everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. Well, who he saying is exalting himself? The Pharisee is obviously exalting himself. But the one who humbles himself will be exalted. How did Jesus exalt him? He gave him eternal life. And if Jesus has given the humble Christian eternal life, 
how much more does he want to fill you with your goodness, his goodness rather, when you humble yourself and you submit and you resist and he exalts you. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Oh, Lord God, that we can have sweet fellowship with God, that we can come to you humbly, surrendering to you, Father, all that we are. All that we are, Lord God, in Christ, we still fall and fail and stumble and sin. But praise be to you that you keep on seeking us, Lord God, to cleanse us and that you may mold us more like Jesus Christ, our Lord. May you remind us, Father, that all things work for good for those who love God. You will bring things in our path, trials and tribulations. And even, Lord God, the devil himself is a pawn in your hand that you may exalt your people, that you may grow your people. But I pray, Father, that no one in this place today, no one, will be proud enough to say, I have enough of Christ. I have all I can handle. May it never be, God. May it never be that you will find one Christian who says, I'm okay with Jesus. It's just me and Jesus and my relationship and my friendship with Christ is never, never errant. Oh, Lord, I pray that you'll be gentle with us, with our arrogance, Lord God, in thinking this way. And for those who are not born again, show them yourself, God. Please, we beg of you. We cannot change anyone, God, no matter how much we preach and teach. Only you can do that. Only you can reveal, as you did Peter, no flesh and blood can reveal to man that Jesus Christ is Lord, but you alone. So we plead with you. I plead with my brethren that we will pray together for the unconverted soul, for the double-minded, for the one who comes to church week in and week out and thinks they're okay, that you will cause them to have absolutely no rest until they see themselves as sinners before you and will be justified by the blood of the Lamb alone. So thank you, Father, that you be in our midst to be glorified. Amen.